So let me make sure I got the ink on. I typically uh, hit it a little bit too soon. So Mason is saying that number one converges and converges absolutely. Okay. Uh, Mason, can you explain why you feel that way? Or um, because the non alternator first, what, what would you call that? Okay, so if I think what you're saying is that if a sub n is uh, negative one to the n over n to the ln of three, then the absolute value of a sub n would be one over n ln of three. Is that what you mean? Yeah, the okay. uh, absolute value um, of the point. Okay, so you're saying that if I did the sum from n equaling one to infinity, of this absolute value of a sub n, um, you, you found that, in fact, let me write this a little bit more correctly here. <clears throat> you found that this tends to what number? Um, I don't know. Did it tend to a number? Oh, it, I'm sorry, you're, which test are you using? I use a P series. Okay, so he's saying that this is essentially a P series. And in this case, what is P? Um, 1.05. So it's the natural log of 3, which is approximately 1.5, which is, there we go, that's the key. This is greater than 1. So the absolute value of our a sub n, uh, that particular series is going to converge. And if that series is going to converge, and by the way, we could even check you know, this first guy here, we could use the alternating series test in conjunction with this to show that the alternating version of this converges, the absolute value of this converges, therefore it converges out. Is that kind of what you're saying essentially? Does anybody have any comments or want to add anything to what I just said there or what Mason just said? Okay, good. So I mentioned some key things there. I, I mentioned AST, which is the alternating series test. And I mentioned uh, P, or Mason mentioned P series. So, okay, good. How about number two? Anybody get number two? Okay, I think I hear a hand going up or a comment being made. Rich! Number two, I got uh, conditionally converges because if you do the AST, um, you'll figure out that as the limit as n goes to infinity, that equals zero, and the uh, nth plus one term will be less than the nth term. So that's good, but if you do the absolute value of it, you'll get one over square root of n plus four. You can then do the limit uh, comparison test using uh, the one over square root of n, and you'll get a positive and finite number, which means that it diverges. Uh, what was that, the last test you just mentioned there when you did the absolute value? Uh, limit comparison uh, test. The limit comparison test? Yeah. Okay, fine, great. The, uh, the limit comparison test diverges. Is that what you said? Yeah. Good. And so therefore, this condition is conditionally converted. Good. Perfect. That's exactly right. So guys, when we start talking about this, in fact, that's where I'm going to start this presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this conditionally versus absolute convergence and how to differentiate the two, no pun intended. Um, so we can see here that example number one, it converged and it converged absolutely because not only did this series converge, but the absolute value of a sub n, that series converges as well. Down here on number two, it turns out that by AST it converges, but unfortunately when we do the um, convergence test, the limit comparison test, convergence test on the absolute value of A sub n that series, it does not converge, it diverges, um, and therefore this is what we call just conditionally convergent. By the end of the presentation today, I'd like to uh, hopefully share with you why that matters. And what I'm saying is this, um, and I mentioned this last week, I mentioned the fact that when you get to some higher level math courses, whether or not a series converges or diverges is, is uh, of interest. But today I hope to show you an interesting result. I, I think you'll think it's interesting, at least I hope you think so. Without further ado, unless there's a question, I'm going to move on. Does anyone have any questions on the two more? Okie dokie.
All right, so um, I am basically rehashing the stuff that I did on the YouTube presentation, and I'm using some different notes, but it's the same idea. So we just talked about what is this absolute convergence mean? We say that a series is absolutely convergent if the absolute value of this series is convergent. And that's exactly what we just looked at at the one on the warm up. And what I think is interesting here is here's the definition of a conditionally convergent series. And this, these are the ones that always make me laugh. A series, uh, at, or a summation A sub n is called conditionally convergent if it's not absolutely convergent. So that's, it converges. I, I guess I should throw that in there. That is important. It converges, but it doesn't converge absolutely. And you might think, okay, that's kind of lame. Um, and it, it, it is lame, but it, it works. Uh, but, but, from these two things, we get idea number three. And my guess is some of you have probably already figured this out. Guys, if a series absolutely converges, guess what? In general, it has to converge. Absolute convergence is a stronger statement than convergence. This is a stronger statement than just converging. A series can converge, but it may not absolutely converge. If a series absolutely converges, not only does it absolutely converge, it also has to regularly converge, if that kind of makes sense. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. And by the way, this is a, I, I actually, I'd like you to think about it right now. In fact, if you got your calculator, get your calculator out. I want you to plug in some values here, because this is an interesting one. So we're asked to find the sum from n equaling 1 to infinity of cosine n over n squared. So for n equals 1, that'd be cosine 1 over 1 squared plus cosine 2 over n. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, let's go in some of the values there. So when you look at up that first one with your calculator, I think you get, and, and guys correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's about 0.5. Uh, 0.540. And then the second term, and again, let me make sure, because last week I was kind of not doing a fantastic job. Let's make sure I do a better job. Okay. So now this second term here, when I put that in there, I think I get negative 0 0.208. Did anyone else get negative 0 0.208? Just, just for this second term. Not the sum. Is that correct? Did I do that right? Okay. I got an eight. I got half of that. Oh, you got half. Oh, maybe I forgot to divide by two. Let me try that again. Let's find that two. Okay, I got, I got this. Oh, there we go. Thank you. That's I, yeah. There. <laughs> okay, so so I'm not starting off on a good good step here. Hopefully, I get this third one right. So I've already botched this one up. Yeah, it's it's not divided by two. It's divided by four. I just screwed that up. So it should be uh, negative point uh, one zero four. And then the third one. Then now I'm feeling a little bit more confident. Now again, we're just talking about that term right there. Hopefully, that is correct. Now, guys, I haven't added things here. So this value here is just this term, cosine 2 divided by 4. This term here is cosine 3 divided by 9 okay, and, and on. In fact, I'll give you one more. I did the next one, too. It's zero, negative 0 0.041. Now, the reason I am mentioning this is, is this an alternating series? No, not really. But you might think, and by the way, um, these answers are going to eventually become positive again, right? So my question is, is our terms in this series going to go positive to negative depending on where you're at? The answer is yes. Now the bottom will always be positive, but cosine is going to alternate from time to time. But it's not going to alternate every other term. So this is kind of a, 
This is a technically a, like an alternating series. In fact, it doesn't fit our definition of what an alternating series is. But there is an important observation, and the observation is this. I hope that you guys would agree that the cosine of n, no matter what n is, and by the way, remember n is, it, it doesn't really matter, but it's going to be integer values, positive integer values. You would agree, no matter what it is, it has to be between negative 1 and 1. Agree? In fact, I hope that you would agree that, strictly speaking, the cosine of n always has to be less than or equal to 1. Okay. In other words, the cosine of n over n squared has to be less than or equal to 1 over n squared. Okay. So, the summation n equaling 1 to infinity of 1 over n squared. Well, do we know how to do that one? What is that? What do we call this kind of series? It's a p-series. We just did that on the form of. And in this case, p is equal to 2, and that happens to be greater than 1, and therefore what? Reverses. Converges. Furthermore, oh, the more the summation I I in N equaling one to infinity of the absolute value of cosine of n over n squared, absolute value, is also convergent. If cosine of n is strictly less than or equal to 1, then doing the absolute value of it, it's just going to, again, it's going to keep all those values in the numerator. They're just, instead of possibly being negative, they're going to be positive, but they are always going to be less than or equal to 1. So this is uh, convergent. And finally, we can draw our final conclusion. So therefore, the series n equals 1 to infinity of the cosine of n over n squared is absolutely convergent. Now, guys, I just threw this example in here. Um, I put example three. That should, should be example one. Sorry. Right. Okay. This is an example of a, a series that I think you might be uncomfortable with because you cannot actually use the alternating series test on this. But we can use the fact that since we know that this is going to converge and its absolute value is going to converge, that it's going to be an absolutely convergent series. And again, what I'm going to try to do here at the end of this uh, presentation is show you why we care. In your, I know that it's not a great answer for me to say, you know, on the AP exam, they're going to ask you if something converges absolutely or, or conditionally. I mean, that might be enough motivation, but who cares, Mr. Helm? Why is it such a big deal? And I'll, I'll show you that. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to the uh, one of the two important tests today. The first one is the ratio test. Now, um, before I do anything with these, let's make sure that we understand the following. Both of these tests are going to be used to prove a series is absolutely convergent. And if a series is absolutely convergent, it is a stronger convergence than just regular convergence. And you might even be able to tell, in fact, I might come back and ask this question later, how is it that we know it's going to be absolutely convergent? So here's the ratio test. And by the way, hopefully you guys know the word ratio is just a fancy word of saying fraction. 
So here's what it says, part I or part one. If the limit as n goes to infinity of the a sub n plus one term divided by a sub n absolute value is equal to L, and that L is less than one, the series has to converge. And it has to converge absolutely. Two. Same thing, limit n goes to infinity of the a sub n plus one term divided by the a sub n. If that's equal to L, but in this case that L is greater than one, in other words, this limit is going to probably go to infinity in most of our examples, but not necessarily. So either of these situations are true, then I mean I think it's pretty intuitive it's going to diverge. By the way, if it diverges, it can't converge at all, right? It can't converge conditionally and it can't converge absolutely. And now I want to emphasize this last one. So here's the bad news about the ratio test. If you use the ratio test and you get one when you do the limit, guess what conclusion you can make? You cannot make any conclusion. This is actually probably one of the most frequently used tests that I use because it's very powerful and it's quick to do it. All you've got to do is find the limit of the n plus one term to the nth term, absolute value, and you can quickly establish if it's convergent absolutely or not. So part three of the ratio test, which I just emphasized, says if the limit of the a sub n plus 1 divided by a sub n absolute value is equal to 1, this test gives so no information. Let me show you the example of that. Consider the following convergent series. By the way, we just talked about this p-series, didn't we? The sum of 1 over n squared. p here is uh, 2, 2 is greater than 1, therefore it's convergent. We already know that, right? So I am going to look at this ratio right here. By the way, we're going to do the limit as n goes to infinity of this, right? So the n plus 1 term, that'd be this right here, that'd be 1 over n plus 1 quantity squared. And this down here, that's our a sub n, which is our original uh, a sub n term. We can multiply by the reciprocal, which is going to give us this. And then what we can do is we can do a little bit of trickery. You'll notice that these are both two powers of 2. And you'll notice that they have n's in them. So we can divide through by n and then pull down that power of 2, and you'll get this right here. And this will go to 1. This limit is equal to 1, as n goes to infinity. Whereas the divergent series, this one right here, the harmonic series, we're talking about the harmonics, I'm not going to go through all the math again. It also goes to 1, as n goes to infinity. So what I'm trying to say is, in case you're not quite sure what I'm saying is, what kind of series was this? Convergent, correct? Using the ratio test, what limit did we get? We got 1. This next example, when we did the ratio test, what limit did we get again? One, and that was a, okay, so I hope you understand what I'm trying to illustrate here. What I'm trying to illustrate here is when you get a result of one, when you use the ratio test, you cannot draw a conclusion because in some cases it would be a convergent series and in other cases it would be a divergent series. So when the limit is one, you cannot draw any conclusion based on the ratio test. So guess what you have to do? Do something else. You have to try something else. Okay. All right. Let's look at an example. Test the convergence of the following series. All right. So we're going to do the ratio test. And to do the ratio test, what we need to do is this: we need to find the limit as n goes to infinity of the a sub n plus one divided by the a sub n term absolute value. Now, in this particular case, is absolute value going to change anything? No, we don't have anything. There's no negatives. There's no alternators or anything like that. 
But I'm, I'm still going to start with this just to kind of reinforce that we're doing absolute value. So this is going to be a limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And then I'm going to divide this by n to the n over n factorial. And then I'll put my absolute value here, even though this isn't really necessary, guys. If you want to leave the absolute value off in this part here, you can. I don't really need it. Everything's positive. I hope that makes sense. I know there's a lot of writing there. So the, this, this piece here is the n plus 1, and then I'm dividing by the n. So remember when we... Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal, right? So I'm going to have n plus 1 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. And I'm going to go ahead and do this maybe in purple just to maybe make it stand out. So now I'm multiplying by the reciprocal, and I know that you guys can handle that. And I've now got rid of the opposite value because it wasn't necessary. Yeah, so what I'm gonna I'm gonna do a couple of things here. We'll, we'll, let's let's actually let's just talk about that. You're talking about the factorial, correct? Or you're talking about power. So first of all, this n plus one factorial is the same thing as n plus one times n factorial. You would agree with that, right? What about this guy up here? Well, we can think of this guy up here as n plus one times what? N plus one to the N. Now stay with me here, okay? This is where things get a little tricky and this is, I'm going to try to go slow and hopefully I don't botch anything up here. I'm going to pause here for a second, let you guys look at that, make sure I didn't screw anything up, but I think we're okay. Everyone okay out there in virtual land? Okay, so here we go. Get ready. I'm going to cancel some things. In fact, let me do that in, let me pick a good color here. I'm going to do it in, I'm going to do it in yellow because I don't want to cover up too much. Would you guys agree that that n plus 1 and that n plus 1 would cancel because one's in the numerator and one's in the denominator? Similarly, this n factorial will cancel with that n factorial. I'm going very slowly here because I, I don't want to make a mistake, first of all, but I also don't want to confuse anybody. So that's going to give me the limit as n goes to infinity. It looks like the only thing left in the numerator is going to be n plus 1 to the n over, and I think I've got n to the n on the bottom. Well, if that's the case, then that's just everything to the nth, isn't it? In other words, it's n plus 1 over n raised to the nth. Well, if that's the case, what could I divide through by? I divide through by n. So then that's going to be 1 plus 1 over n over 1 all of that to the nth. I'm going to go faster now. Hopefully the output is getting a little bit easier to see. Now, uh, hopefully someone's going to make my day. Maybe. Who wants to make my day now? Go ahead. That equals E. Correct. This is the definition of E. And what do we know about E? Well, the most important thing we know is if it's greater than 1. And by the way, if it's greater than 1, then we are in this case right here, right? If the limit is greater than 1, it has to be divergent. So, therefore, 
divergent by ratio test. And by the way, guys, if it's divergent, it can't be convergent, and it can't be absolutely convergent. It can't be conditionally. It can't be anything but divergent. Now, I guess I'm, I'm going to pause here for just a second and just ask the question. Um, the question is this. When, when you first saw this problem, and look at all this work, and that, that's impressive looking work, isn't it? But when you looked at this originally, what was your gut instinct? Was your instinct that it was convergent or divergent? I'm just, I, you don't have to answer that. I'm just curious what you think. And I'm telling you that since it's divergent, that tells us something about this n to the n and this n factorial. Since it's divergent, what does that tell us? Right. And when you think about it, it makes sense. N to the n, if we were to look at, you know, starting with one, two, so it's one to the one, two to the two, versus n factorial. Well, that, and by the way, what are we doing with all these? We're, you know, these are growing very, it turns out this, this top guy is growing at, like, like uh, Jack said, at a faster rate than the n factorial. And by the way, n factorial grows faster than almost you know, all the other things we've looked at in this class. So it's kind of interesting. Um, you need to be careful, though, to not make assumptions with these um, series because sometimes, and I'll be honest, I, I kind of make a mistake myself. Sometimes you'll jump to conclusions uh, that aren't correct. So comments or questions on this one? I know this one was pretty involved. Um, but I also think that, you know, kind of the involved ones kind of help you see the math a little bit better. Would you guys agree that this was kind of the hard step right here or the difficult step is knowing how to, you know, kind of break those out so that things will cancel. So anyways, I'm going to move on unless someone has a question. I guess I kind of squeezed all that into one slide. I didn't need this extra slide. Okay. Note, although the ratio test works in example two, an easier method would have been just to use the test for divergence. Some, some of you may have been thinking about that. We could have just done, again, we've got this n to the n over n factorial. We could look at that, that's n times n times n times n, over one times two times. Clearly that's gonna be uh, greater than or equal to n, so it follows that a sub n cannot go to zero. And therefore, n has to go to infinity, as n goes to infinity, therefore has to diverge. So I guess what I'm trying to say here with this slide here, and you might say, Mr. Allen, that was a lot of work you did back here. The easier way to have approached this was to just use the test for divergence. Here's the thing that you're facing on the test and on the AP exam. They're not going to tell you, hey, use the ratio test. And by the way, sometimes on the quiz question, or the test questions or quiz questions, I might say, hey, use the, this test or that test. But in general, you're not going to know. You're going to have to figure out which one to use. Okay, let's look at another one here. So the first one diverged. So what's your gut instinct on this one? You know, Mr. L. Actually, you want to try this one? Why don't you guys try this one? I'll give you a few minutes. I'll give you, uh, let's do four minutes here real quick. I'm kind of hinting at what I think the answer is. Uh, just see if you can show the work and, and figure out if this one converges or diverges. And while you're doing that, I think I'm going to send you guys a little poll question in virtual land.
30 seconds. Thank you for answering the poll question. Second question, you got the right answer? Good. All right, so let's go ahead and look at this one. Again, I think I'll use that yellow. That kind of worked out nicely. So this n plus 1 to the third, okay, we could break that down if we wanted to. This 3 to the n, that's not really helpful. But this guy right down here, we could definitely, well, let me do that. No, let's do that. We can think of this as 3 times 3 to the n. So that's really nice. So what that's telling us, now we go to the yellow, is that this is going to cancel this. And guys, I'm not even actually sure why I wrote absolute value symbols there, right? With the absolute value symbols killed those negatives, right? So let me just put, uh, maybe make those parentheses. Sorry, we don't need the absolute value symbol. The absolute value symbol got rid of the negative. So now, uh, we're essentially left with the following. We've got the limit as n goes to infinity of n plus 1 over n to the third, and then this whole thing here is going to be 1 over 3 from that 3 in the denominator, right? Well, as n goes to infinity, what's n plus 1 over n? It's 1, right? Or again, we could, you know, here I'll show one more step here. We could again say, the following, we could say one third times, and then this is going to be one plus one over n, all over one. Now we're taking this to the third. N's going to infinity. That's basically going to be one plus zero over one. That's one to the third, which is one. So this limit is one third. That's our limit. This is less than one. Therefore, it is absolutely convergent by the ratio test. Does that make sense? Hopefully you guys can figure that one out on your own, but I have all the work there. Comments and questions on that one? Are we doing okay? So basically guys, to do the ratio test, this, this is it in a nutshell, right? This right here. Do the limit of the absolute value of the a sub n plus 1 term divided by a sub n. If that limit is less than 1, absolutely convergent. If it's greater than 1, like in our last example, it is divergent. If it's equal to 1, no conclusion. Okay? All right, so here's our second and final convergence test. Yay! Last one. This one's called the root test. You must have strong root Daniel sign. And here's what it says. We, we use this when we have powers of things. You'll see this. In fact, I'll just show you the next example. Um, you see this next example? You see how it's to the nth power? This is a perfect example of when we want to use this test. And here's what it says. It says if the limit, as n goes to infinity, of the nth root, this is the nth root, of the absolute value of a sub n is equal to L, and that L is less than 1, then the series is absolutely complete. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. I, I mean, it's almost verbatim from the ratio test, but we're not doing a ratio here. We're doing the nth root. Two, if the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of the absolute value of a sub n is equal to L, and L is greater than 1, or if it's infinity, Guess what? Divergent. And finally, part three, if the limit of the nth root is equal to one, guess what? Inconclusive. It almost feels like the same thing as the ratio test. The difference is, is we're not doing the ratio, we are doing the nth root. So, again, in part three, the root test says that the test gives no information if that limit's one. The series sum of a sub n could be convergent or divergent. 
if L is equal to 1, the ratio test, don't try the root test because L is going to be 1 again. So let me explain what's going on. You get on the AP exam. Let's say it's May 4. Ooh, that's weird. Uh, you're, you're getting some sum. I don't know what it is. And I'm just going to put A sub N, whatever that is. I have no idea. And you're going to have to try to figure out which test do I need to use to figure out if it's convergent or divergent. Let's just say in this case that we, we think it's convergent. Can you try the ratio test? Because actually it's one of the first ones I said that I use. And it gives you a one. Well, this is what I'm trying to tell you is you don't need to try the root test because the root test is going to give you the same thing. Okay? All right. So here we go. Let's look at this. Uh, I think this is my last real example. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about why we want to know about this absolute convergence versus conditional convergence. Hey, guys, I'll be honest. I think the root test is, is probably the easiest one. Guess when you're going to use the root test? Most of the time, it's going to be when you've got some expression to the nth power. Now, be careful. If you look back at some of the earlier examples I did today, there were some nth powers in there, but it was a little bit different than what we have here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to show that this is not only convergent, but absolutely convergent using the root test. So what I want to do is I want to do the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of the absolute value of a sub n. Now the absolute value here isn't going to matter. So what we're going to have in this particular problem, I'll do it in purple, is we're going to do the limit as n goes to infinity of the nth root of 2n plus 3 over 3n plus 2 to the n. And that's perfect because guess what happens to the power of n and the nth root? They basically kill each other or they become one. So you get the limit as n goes to infinity. Now we're talking a very easy calc one question, aren't we? Oops, that's a two. What is the limit of that fraction? You can just look at it and see, can't you? What is it? It's two thirds. And guess what's true about two thirds? It is less than one. So let me jump back here real quickly. Via the root test, if the limit is less than one, this series is absolutely convergent. So we are going to conclude, therefore, the series 2n plus 3 over 3n plus 2 to the nth power is absolutely convergent by the root test. And it's kind of a nice way to end this, uh, all these root tests or all these tests, because it's, I think that's maybe the easiest one. There's not a lot to know. You just do the nth root of it. It basically kills the exponent. And then you've got, in this case, a very easy limit to deal with. So root test is probably even easier than the ratio test. Comments or questions on that one? Now, thank you for bearing with me through five sections. <laughs> of tests. We've talked about integral tests, we've talked about p-series, we've talked about geometric, we've talked about um, telescoping, we've talked about alternating, we've talked about ratio tests, we've talked about root tests, we've talked about comparison tests. I mean, it's we've talked about a lot. So your, your head might be swimming right now with all of this stuff, and uh, rightfully so. So it's going to be kind of your job over the next couple of weeks to kind of figure out some strategies on how to attack these problems. All right, so now I want to talk about why do we care if a series is convergent or divergent? And this is, uh, I think this is really fascinating. So you can just kind of sit back. If you want to take some notes, you can, but I think I've got pretty much everything written out here that you need. It says the question on whether a given convergent series is absolutely convergent or conventionally convergent has a bearing on a question of whether infinite sums behave like finite sums. What I mean by a finite sum would be, let's say I had 2 plus 3 plus 4, which you guys would agree that's a finite sum. In other words, there's a, 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 a countable number of numbers that we're adding together. So my question is, is for example, is 3 plus 2 plus 4, are those two things equal? Obviously, you guys know that that is true. 
If we rearrange the order of the terms of a finite sum, then of course the values of the sum remains unchanged. This is not always the case with them. Um, there's a mathematician by uh, the name of Riemann, you might recognize that name. Uh, he has a very famous problem called the Riemann hypothesis, which I think I've mentioned before is worth $1 million. It is the uh, considered the crown jewel of mathematics right now. If you can prove the theorem, you get $1 million from the Clay Institute. So Riemann was the first mathematician to uh, kind of discover this property of infinite sum, sum infinite series. And here's what it says, by the rearrangement of an infinite series, we mean the series obtained by simply changing the order of some of the terms. For example, this series here, if we had a sub one plus a sub two plus a sub three plus da 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 da. What if I took that fifth term and put it in front of the third and fourth term? What if I took the 15th term and I put it before the sixth and seventh term, and et cetera. It turns out, and this is the key idea right here, it turns out, which is not intuitive, and I'll be honest, it's not intuitive to me either, if the sum is absolutely convergent, the series, the sum of the series doesn't change. Then any rearrangement has the same sum if it's absolutely converted. Can you guess where we're going? If it's absolutely converted, the sum will not change. Okay, so you, hopefully you guys can already figure out where I'm going next. However, any, any conditionally convergent series can be arranged to give a different sum. In fact, it can give you any value you want. any so for example do you guys remember this one here do you guys remember what we call the name of this one? Oh, i guess i wrote it here didn't i <laughs> the alternate alternating harmonic series we showed that that was a convergent series correct however what do we know about the harmonic series it is divergent correct therefore what do we know about the alternating harmonic series it is conditionally convergent here's what i'm telling you this, by the way, is a fact. This sum, I'm telling you that the sum of the alternating harmonic series, which by the way seems kind of odd, is the natural log of two. However, I'm telling you, if you rearrange the order of these terms, you can get any number you want. Any number you want. You can get pi, you can get a million, you could get a Googleplex, you could get whatever number you want. Now I'm going to show you an example of that, okay? So here we go. Here's our alternating harmonic series right there. We know that by, by fact, and I haven't shown you why that is, I hope you'll just trust me, you can look it up, but it's ln of 2. Let's multiply this entire series through by 1 half. So 1 times 1 half is 1 half. 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth. Now notice, that's negative, so that's still negative. So in other words, we multiplied everything through by one half. Now, if I multiply everything on the left side by one half, what do I have to do to the right hand side? Also have to multiply through by one half. Would you guys agree with that? Okay, so far so good? Great, moving on. Now, inserting zeros between the terms of the series. So by the way, I'm adding zero, which does not change this right hand side, correct? So if I add 0, 0, plus 0, plus 0, does it change anything, correct? So all I've done is from this slide to the next one is I put 0. So I put a 0 in the front, a 0 between the first and the second, put a 0 between. The, and again, we're adding 0, so that's not really changing anything. Now, we are going to add this equation and this equation. So we are going to do 1 plus zero, which is, we are going to do negative one half plus one half, which is, uh, one third. did I say that? I feel like I didn't say that right. Did I screw me up? Oh, that doesn't seem right. Oh, I got my order wrong, didn't I? You're doing six, which is the bottom. 
Oh, thank you. This one here? Yeah. Gotcha. So one half. I screwed something up. Okay, I think I botched this one up. I think I put the wrong terms in. How did I get the one? Then I got one third here. Okay, so we have this plus this. One plus zero is one. That's correct. One plus negative one zero. You see that? Yeah. Am I doing the wrong? Did I do it right? You have a negative one half and a positive one half. So you zero. So you just left it. Oh. Thank you. Okay, so let me write that down. So that'd be zero. Okay, I got it now. I got it. Sorry. I was sweating. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing this right. Okay, guys, let me try that. Oh, wrong way. Let's try that again. So one plus uh, zero is one. All right. Okay, so one plus zero is one. Then the next part, let's go back here. Now I'm doing negative one half plus one half. That's zero. Uh, then this, oh my goodness, let me get the pen going here. There we go. This is going to be one third, then plus zero, then minus one half, then plus zero, then plus one fifth. I kind of skipped an intermediate. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's try that again. One plus zero is one. A negative one half plus one half is zero. One third plus zero is one third. Negative one fourth minus one fourth. Uh, did I say that right? It would be that negative half. Oh, right, correct. Negative one fourth and negative one fourth is negative one half, correct. And then the next one plus uh, zero is, um, yeah, anyways, this is what you get. Now, what is this? If I add one half to one, what is one half plus one? It is three halves. Interesting. Now, notice that the series in eight contains the same terms as in six. So eight is this one. Look at these terms. Now let's go back to six. Look at these terms. So basically what we have shown is that, and by the way, what does six equal? We have shown that the ln of two is equal to what? Three halves the ln of two. Look at us, we did it. That's not possible. That's, as soon as you see something like this, you know that there's something wrong. So it turns out, and let me go back to the first slide. If a series is absolutely convergent, it will have the same sum no matter how you rearrange the terms. However, if a series is conditionally convergent, you can basically make the series equal any value that you want by rearranging the terms. You can make it be as big as you want. In fact, there's videos on this. I might post some in the uh, extra videos for this uh, class. Uh, for the uh, extra videos for the module for this class. But anyway, so this is this is the reason why. Conditionally convergent series, unfortunately, they don't behave very nicely. They don't have the property of commutativity. In other words, adding things in the same order or different order gives you the same result. Okay, guys, that brings us to right at one hour. Uh, the last thing I need for you to do is fill out an exit slip. Uh, right here. Oh, and I had another poll question and I forgot to do that. That's a that. There we go. Okay, you guys can fill out the exit slip. And um, oh, by the way, next week I will not be here. Um, just to let you know, my son's surgery got delayed two weeks. So next week you will be uh, with a sub. Um, she actually has her master's degree in math, so that's good. And I gave her all my notes. 
and uh, information today. You may want to, if you're uh, an eager student, you may want to look at section 8.7 before next week. Um, I mean, I guess you're kind of supposed to do that anyways, just to make sure that you kind of have some idea of what's going on. Um, obviously, she hasn't talked talk to us probably in a while. So anyways, I will be here for the next 30 minutes available for questions if you have them. Good one, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, Hunter. Have a good day. Mr. Allen, yes, I can